Today we have a topic so hot it's literally smoking. Well, vaping. <laughs> All right, well, I tried. So roll the clip. Vaping. 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 We all know what vaping is, but what's actually going on inside that precious jewel? Why does it elicit such powerful physiological and emotional responses in the user? What is that? Are you really vaping? And most importantly, how does it impact their long-term health? Over the course of this series, and yes, this topic is just too big to fit into one video, we'll cover each of these questions in depth as I provide a detailed medical analysis of the little piece of plastic that seems to have our society in a chokehold. We'll also discuss the societal factors that have an impact on the proliferation of this device and why our society is the perfect host for this type of epidemic. But First things first, we need to understand how our precious actually works. In technical terms, a vape is an electronic cigarette or device that simulates tobacco smoking. It consists of an atomizer or heating device, a power source such as a battery, and a container such as a cartridge or tank filled with liquid. This liquid contains propylene glycol or glycerol, which is a synthetic liquid substance that absorbs water. It is the base that carries the nicotine, which, as you'll soon find out, happens to be the star of our show. You breathe in, which activates the battery that powers the heating device. This in turn heats up the liquid and produces an aerosol or vapor, which you inhale into your mouth and lungs. Instead of smoke, the user inhales vapor, hence the name. These are tiny particles that you can inhale in. They go through the mouth, through the main airway, down into the lungs, where they can mingle with oxygen and carbon dioxide. At the microscopic level, the lungs consist of thousands of tiny air sacs called alveoli. These alveoli are responsible for the exchange of gases between the air we breathe in and our blood. And as such, this is effectively ground zero, where chemicals from the vapor leach into the bloodstream, causing an intense physiological response inside the body and the brain. A portable, easy to use device that provides an intense hit sounds too good to be true. Almost as if they were designed to take us for a ride as they say. Enter Hong Lik. Hong Lik is a Chinese pharmacist who created a device known as the Ruyan, an alternative to conventional smoking. As he mentioned, he started smoking young, increasing potency and frequency as he got older. In 2002, his quest to develop an electronic cigarette to help himself and others quit smoking began. A noble goal, with powerful personal implications for Hong Lik, whose father was a lifelong smoker that unfortunately lost the battle with lung cancer. You can bet that a device powerful enough to circumvent the addictive potential of an actual cigarette must be quite potent by its very design. You may be surprised to learn that Han Lick wasn't the first to attempt the creation of such a device. In fact, vape experts seem to agree that the first documented reference to a primitive vape appeared in the 1920s. You're looking at a patent for an electric vaporizer, made by a man named Joseph Robinson, though we don't know if there was ever a working prototype. Later in the 1960s, Herbert A. Gilbert actually constructed a device that closely resembles the e-cig, but it too never made it all the way to market. Finally, at the end of the 1970s, a computer pioneer, Phil Ray, and his physician, Norman Jacobson, developed a working variation of the e-cigarette that relied on evaporation thinking this would be healthier than the burning of tobacco. This device was meant to deliver nicotine and actually did make it a market, even reaching major retailers. However, it too was unsuccessful. Why? Well, in 1979, when this device came out, people were still smoking indoors. 
Smoking on airplanes wasn't even fully banned until 1988. I kind of feel like I'm in the bottom of a coal mine, like I'm an old coal worker with all the smoke a lot of times. I know most flight attendants do have sinus problems. And although the 1964 Surgeon General's report on smoking and health was a turning point in raising awareness about the health risks of smoking, the societal quest to quit was far from its zenith. At that time, the world may not have been ready to receive a smoking cessation device, with open arms. Make a place for the smokers and a place for the non-smokers yeah. that segregated off. Not herders out here like bloody prostitutes standing on this corner. You're taking the, our rights away from us. Well, for one thing, I've never smoked in the street. Never. And I don't like smoking in the street. How does it make you feel? Well, not very good. In 2003, however, when Han Lick first brought his e-cigarette to the Chinese market, many were desperate for an alternative to smoking and his product really caught on. Then, according to the Heart and Stroke Foundation, it began to spread to Canada in 2004, to the UK in 2005, and to the US in 2007. Warnings concerning the unknown health implications of this new device weren't even raised until 2009. And the regulatory bodies associated with tobacco-based products wouldn't gain control for years. America's FDA only finalized the rule extending its authority to cover all tobacco products, including e-cigarettes, in 2016. In Europe, the Tobacco Products Directive, or TPD, which set out regulations for the manufacture, presentation, and sale of tobacco and related products, was first introduced in 2014. Here in Canada, it wasn't until 2018 that the Tobacco and Vaping Products Act was put into place, which regulates the manufacture, sale, labeling, and promotion of both tobacco and vaping products. Due to the continued proliferation of these devices, you may be skeptical about the role that these regulatory bodies are even playing. According to Yahoo Finance, the vaping industry raked in approximately $22 billion in 2022 alone. And according to a 2022 meta-analysis conducted by Hadi Tehran et al., the vaping rates according to continent are America, 10%, Europe, 14%, Asia 11% and Oceania 6%. So approximately one tenth of the population is using vapes. Off the books, something tells me the numbers might even be higher. Besides vaping usage increasing in general, it is also insanely popular amongst the younger population. According to the FDA's National Youth Tobacco Survey, 10% of teens use tobacco and their favorite tobacco product for the 10th year in a row is, you guessed it, the vape. The 2022 to 2023 Canadian Tobacco and Nicotine Survey says something similar. Skyrocketed among America's youth. An epidemic among adolescents. No one should use vaping products, period. Wait, I thought this was a smoking cessation device. You know, like it says here. For years, vaping has been touted as a safer alternative to smoking cigarettes. So, were all these teens smoking before? And why the intense backlash? If it helps some people quit smoking, does it deserve all the flack it's really getting? Are they demonizing this because it's actually bad or because it's a threat to profits for an established company that has a shit ton of money? The cigarette companies, right. Good question, Joe. Who's profiting off all this? And what about you interns? Are you confused yet? By now, as I'm sure you can tell, this is an extremely complex, multifaceted issue for which, spoiler alert, we don't exactly have a conclusive answer. But I will tell you what I know and my thoughts as a doctor who is committed to health. A surgeon. As always, I encourage you to draw your own conclusions. In my humble opinion, that's why the comment section <laughs> exists. So we have our smoking cessation device. It was, and still is by many, considered a healthier alternative to cigarettes. If you weren't aware, smoking is the leading cause of preventable death. Period. As the CDC states, one in five deaths annually are caused by smoking. Obviously, that's concerning for everyone. Smokers and non-smokers alike. And it's been like that for a while. Statistics show that 68% of people who smoke want to quit. They want to quit, but they can't. So why not? This is why y'all get addicted, because it's so fun to do with friends. We'll get into the addictive properties of nicotine a bit later, but for now, just know this. Addiction ain't easy, and withdrawal ain't even fun. So what, are smokers doomed? Who can help? Well, most of the notable e-cigarette innovators, the people responsible for the rise of vaping, 
have always claimed that saving smokers' lives was their initial mission. That's what inspired them. Similar to Han Lick before them, Juul inventors Adam Bowen and James Moses also wanted to help get rid of cigarettes. Seems to me that these people genuinely wanted to do good. Innovation can address all the problems associated with smoking. And our goal, our mission, is to eliminate combustible cigarettes. Now, the main health issue associated with smoking, whether it's through cigarettes, pipes, or other forms of combustible tobacco, is the process of combustion itself. According to the American Lung Association, aside from the nicotine, which is also found in vapes, cigarettes contain approximately 600 ingredients and when burned, produce a mix of 7,000 chemicals, 69 of which are known to be cancer causing and many are toxic. So if vaping can heat the substance enough without burning it to give the user a comparable experience, then getting a vape into the hands of all smokers seems like a must. It was a huge opportunity for public health and it could drastically improve the lives of so many. And of course, make a whole heaping lot of money, bro. And I live in a suburb in Ontario, Canada, and I'm addicted to vaping. Actually, is it cool if I rip a fat cloud real quick in here? Hey everyone, I know you've seen those ads on cigarette boxes. Pretty scary, huh? Well, we found a way to help. Introducing the vape. With this, you can continue to smoke in a safe, well, safer, we think, way. Yay! We've already established that cigarettes introduce many harmful chemicals into your body due to the process of combustion, and that the vape offers a comparable dose of nicotine while allowing the user to avoid a large amount of the harsh chemicals found in cigarette smoke. As you may have guessed, the story <laughs> doesn't end there. Not even a little bit. I think vaping is a healthy alternative to smoking, 100%. Maybe not so much, but it's better for you than cigarettes. In theory, exchanging your cigarettes for a vape should help the user avoid some of the side effects associated with smoking. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, lung diseases, diabetes, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Smoking also increases risk for tuberculosis, certain eye diseases, and problems of the immune system, including rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, cigarettes can seriously damage almost every organ in your body. What may start off like this, might end up like this. In comparison, vaping must be healthier, right? Yet again, I must encourage you to increase your tolerance for complexity, since matters of health aren't often so black and white. It seems to me that vaping may solve one problem while simultaneously causing another, which we will discuss in a bit. Over the course of this video, I want you to ask yourself, does healthier mean healthy? And how exactly do we define healthier in relation to products or behaviors whose negative impact on health is very difficult to identify? Ominous, I know. But you'll begin to <coughs> see through the smoke as we progress. As long as people are using it for the tool that it is, which is to help you cut down, then it's 100% such a benefit to you. This is an interesting comment. First off, the idea that vapes help quit smoking was never and is still not approved by the FDA. This means you can't get a prescription for it, at least not in North America, and it's not supported by the government as a smoking sensation device, only a recreational product. However, Australia has actually made vapes entirely illegal for sale except by prescription. Still, in most places, vapes are just on the shelves, available for purchase at regular stores. But just because they're not officially recognized as a medicinal product doesn't mean they aren't being used as one, at least by some. People definitely try to use vapes to quit smoking, and some claim that it helps. But this has yet to be agreed upon in the scientific community. Vaping was sold to the public as a tool to help smokers give up their addiction. The medical industry says that's rubbish. I can tell you, however, that in 2017, a study conducted by Dr. Golam Reza Haidari et al. looked at all articles on PubMed on the topic of e-cigarettes, published before 2014. Of the 69 that mentioned the possibility of vaping aiding in smoking cessation, two-thirds said no and one-third said yes. No biggie. 
We know science can sometimes lag behind practical experience because of the publication processes. Granted, that was almost a decade ago. But even so, as of today, the evidence is still inconclusive and still evolving. Any addiction revolves around a craving and our behavioral response to said craving, physiologically and psychologically, the process of addiction is far more complex than that. But this simplified definition will suffice for the time being. Now, we may rely primarily on one object or behavior, like a vape, to replace a more dangerous object or behavior, a smoke, but that does not address the underlying craving driving our addiction. Think of the addiction like a chain, where the ultimate goal is to break the chain, and in this context, we replace one link with another link that may be easier to break at a later time. That is to say, a cessation device. If we replace one link with another, but never manage to break the chain, well, can a device that just replaces one link with another one and never addresses the underlying addiction be accurately called a cessation device? It seems to me that vaping may be considered by some an end in and of itself, rather than a means to quit cigarettes or end the underlying nicotine addiction. I can't be sure that some vape users have ever even thought that deeply about it, but as we've already covered with the above studies, the jury is still out regarding the efficacy of this tool to assist in either of these goals. Granted, if you are someone who is hoping to use vapes to quit smoking and nicotine altogether, I would suggest treating it like any other nicotine replacement therapy with a quit date and associated plan to reduce usage gradually over time. Ironically, some people who use vaping to help them quit cigarettes just continue to use both, so-called dual use. Sometimes people do this intentionally to make the transition easier. There are studies on the successfulness of dual use, and again, the results are inconclusive. Some say this method helps, some say it does not. Some say it only helps short term, and then smokers relapse, so. A study performed by the University of Wisconsin's Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention found that those who smoke and vape at the same time will either just continue using both, or if anything, are more likely to actually quit vaping than smoking. Associate Director of Research and Senior Author Megan Piper claims that one reason for this may be because the e-cigarettes weren't giving enough of a nicotine hit as regular cigarettes were. I do have to mention, however, this study was conducted at a time when free-based nicotine was still used in vapes. At the present time, vapes are manufactured using nicotine salt, which is far more concentrated. It is possible that these newer models of e-cigarettes will be more effective as a supplement, and I'm sure these studies will continue, and over time, we'll be able to get a clearer picture. Relax, look at my coat. You can't just buy these on the internet. While on this topic, though, I want to quickly discuss nicotine salts, which are a huge development in the rise of vaping. Nicotine salts, or Nick salts for short, were first developed by Zing Shen Wei, a chemist working in the Juul labs. They are smoother than conventional free-based nicotine at high concentrations. Dr. Robert Proctor, who is a tobacco historian at Stanford, explains. If you conjugate nicotine with a weak organic acid, so-called salt nicotine, then it burned the throat less. This allows for higher levels of nicotine to be inhaled without throat or airway irritation which was the problem with conventional free-based nicotine. This is traditional nicotine solution, sometimes referred to as free-based, don't get excited. We won't dive too deep here, just know that free-based nicotine has a more alkaline structure, making it less stable and harsher on the throat, while nicotine salts have a stabilized structure derived from adding acids, resulting in a smoother and more bioavailable form of nicotine for inhalation. It's a kind of a chemical trickery that allows the body's normal defense mechanisms to be overcome. And as Dr. Robert Jackler, who is an MD, professor, and chair at Stanford and tobacco marketing expert explains, the issue with a regular e-cigarette was this. It had a bite in your throat. And what it did is it inhibited the ability to raise the nicotine level up because it got too bitter. Juul literally had a Juul with this one. <laughs> <laughs> they tested it and ramped up the dosage until it was just right. The perfect hit to satisfy a smoker. Before nicotine salt, vapes weren't nearly as powerful an alternative, but now? 
We'll circle back around to talk more about Juul in our next episode, as they are very important in understanding the rise of vaping and its societal implications. Sure, there were other vapes on the market at the time they launched, but Juul pretty much reinvented the game and is largely responsible for the modern vape culture. But back to Nick Saltz. Because of the easier nicotine delivery, many people may actually be incentivized to vape instead of smoking. However, Creating a more intense product may also increase their nicotine dependency overall and make the usage of vapes, even in former non-smokers, more likely in general. Not only delivered a perfect level of nicotine to the brain, but could be used almost anywhere. The perfect engine of addiction. Sounds like a huge win for the e-cigarette companies. Is that a thing we should bring into the world? For us and our health, I'm not too sure. According to a 2020 article published by Nicotine and Tobacco Research, dual use may actually lead to a reduction of cigarette usage. In this article, Ursula Martinez et al. cites three studies with interesting findings. Study number one concluded 46% of vapors who were daily or occasional smokers at baseline reported they quit smoking after 12 months. Study number two conducted with regular vapors among the subsample of daily smokers reported that 28% quit smoking combustible cigarettes after 12 months. And study number three found that dual users who continued vaping were more likely to report having quit smoking over time compared to those who stopped using e-cigarettes or never used them. That sounds promising. However, this study also concluded that while it may lead to a reduction of cigarette usage, overall nicotine usage and dependence increased. It's helping the cravings for the cigarette specifically by reinforcing your addiction to the most addictive substance within said cigarettes, nicotine, which comes with health implications of its own. The chemical nicotine is naturally found in the tobacco plant as well as the nightshade family of plants. Yes, even in produce like tomatoes, eggplants, etc. Turns out that the human body is biologically susceptible to nicotine due to a certain family of receptors throughout the body and nervous system that readily bind to it. Nicotine can hijack the receptor site as though it were acetylcholine, giving it an incredible amount of influence over any of the associated functions, which we'll cover in detail shortly. Nicotine can do this because it shares a similar structure to acetylcholine allowing it to interact with these specific receptors. The receptor sites in question have thus been named nicotinic. Thus, we can begin to understand why fellow YouTuber Dr. Andrew Huberman considers nicotine the molecule that has fundamentally changed human evolution, human consciousness, and human experience. Again, these nicotinic receptors are locations in the brain to which nicotine binds and can exert its effects. They also exist in the body. Let's dig in, shall we? So while acetylcholine and nicotine can have a powerful impact on brain and body function, acetylcholine occurs naturally within us, while nicotine does not. Because they can both bind to the same receptors, a deeper understanding of what acetylcholine does when it binds to said nicotinic receptor will also help us to deepen our understanding of nicotine's effect on the body. When binding to nicotinic receptors, acetylcholine, and by extension nicotine, exerts various effects on the various subdivisions of our nervous system. First, let's consider its effect on the peripheral nervous system, which consists of nerves and ganglia, or clusters of nerve cells, that lie outside the brain and spinal cord. These are the nerves that communicate with our skeletal musculature. Acetylcholine facilitates this communication at a place called the neuromuscular junction. That is where nerves and muscles meet. When acetylcholine talks to the nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction, it's like flipping a switch that makes your muscles contract or move. These nicotinic receptors are like key players in making your muscles move when your nerves tell them to. And they're also involved in how nerves communicate in your body. When nicotine binds to these receptors throughout the body, it mimics the action of acetylcholine, causing the receptors to activate. In the context of the muscles, especially at the neuromuscular junction, nicotine-induced activation of nicotinic receptors can lead to increased muscle contractions, hence its stimulating and alertness-inducing properties. However, though it may initially have stimulant effects, chronic exposure and addiction can lead to health issues. I mean, who would want to be tense 
all the time. Now we arrive in the central nervous system, which includes the spinal cord and the brain, where nicotine has an extremely pronounced effect. Firstly, nicotine is a lipophilic substance, meaning it is fat soluble and can move relatively freely throughout the body and easily cross cell membranes, including the blood brain barrier. Once inside, nicotine has several major effects that I'd like to discuss with a little more help, of course, from Dr. Huberman, whose video on nicotine is very thorough for those of you interested in more information. First, nicotine actually stimulates the release of more acetylcholine in the brain by directly activating nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, or NACHRs, in a place called the nucleus basalis. This implies that in normal function, acetylcholine stimulates the release of, that is correct, more acetylcholine in this location. However, under normal circumstances, this process is tightly regulated through feedback mechanisms to maintain balance. But when nicotine mimics acetylcholine by activating nicotinic receptors, it bypasses the normal regulatory feedback loops, leading to a less controlled release of neurotransmitters, disrupting the usual balance in the neurotransmission process. Acetylcholine released from nucleus basalis leads to a sort of spotlighting or highlighting of particular neural circuits in the brain. Thanks, doc. So the nucleus basalis is a tiny cluster of neurons located deep within the brain, near the base of the forebrain, which is responsible for voluntary actions, thinking, and processing. It's like a special switchboard that sends signals to other parts of the brain to keep everything working well. The nucleus basalis has extensive axonal projections, think long tendrils or arms, that reach out to various regions throughout the brain, through which it delivers the acetylcholine that it creates. Acetylcholine is released, it tends to be released at particular locations in the brain that are associated with whatever activity we happen to be doing. And when it arrives, acetylcholine helps the neurons at the location to which it has been delivered communicate more effectively. As such, the information processing associated with the particular thing we are focused on is enhanced directly. And all of a sudden, those neural circuits get a boost. They become more active. It literally increases our, our attention for that and not anything else. Are you still with us? There is a tiny little octopus deep in the brain with arms that reach out throughout the brain that when activated by acetylcholine or nicotine, delivers a boost to the brain regions that are already actively engaged in a specific task, amplifying our focus on that task. Just like English. That's about as simple as I can think to put it. Now imagine that that octopus had a twin. Let's call that twin locus ceruleus. Also a small cluster of neurons with axons reaching throughout the brain. Only this time located deep within the brainstem region near the bottom of the brain at the back of the skull. When activated by acetylcholine or nicotine, this octopus happily delivers norepinephrine around the brain, which of course will increase levels of alertness, energy, and arousal. Essentially serve as a wake up signal elevating levels of energy. Nice little pick me up. Since norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that plays an important part in our fight or flight response, increasing our heart rate and blood pressure. Similar in effect to adrenaline. The experience of heightened arousal and energy stacks on top of the enhanced focus and attention associated with increased acetylcholine release. And we still have perhaps the most powerful effect of all left to cover. Nicotine receptors also live in our brain's reward system, known as the mesolimbic reward pathway. Think of this system like a bridge between two major clusters of neurons, the nucleus accumbens on the one end and the ventral tegmental area or VTA on the other. This system is responsible for making certain behaviors like eating or reproducing pleasurable so that we continue to do them and well, survive. Nicotine acts on the nicotinic receptors located in this pathway and triggers the release of dopamine from the nucleus accumbens. Increases motivation, it tends to give a very transient increase in feelings of well-being. <laughs> That's not all, folks. As nicotine also triggers the release of certain neurochemicals from the ventral tegmental area itself, and those impinge on nucleus accumbens increase dopamine levels further. So reactions occurring on both ends of the mesolimbic reward pathway increase dopamine levels in tandem. Since dopamine is a neurotransmitter linked to pleasure, these two reactions boil down to a pretty simple equation. More dopamine equals more fun. 
Its release reinforces the pleasurable effects of smoking, creating a connection between smoking and feeling good. As you can imagine, this connection is a key factor in the development of addiction, as the brain starts to crave the rewarding sensations associated with nicotine. On top of stimulating a potent amount of dopamine release, Nicotine simultaneously stimulates the release of the neurotransmitter GABA in certain brain regions. GABA has inhibitory effects, and when released, it can inhibit the neurons that would normally act as a stop signal to regulate dopamine release. It's getting in the way of chemicals that would normally stop dopamine, contributing to the heightened and prolonged release of dopamine. Oh boy. And so this is like pushing on the accelerator for dopamine, but also removing the brake. So there's a two pronged effect. Or in not so many words, no doubt. And this occurs on top of the effects we mentioned before. Starting to get the picture. I mean, most of us could use a little motivation, focus, alertness. But typically the effects of nicotine will come on in about two to 15 minutes, as I mentioned before, and then will last anywhere from about 30 to 45 minutes. Oh, so the catch is, if you wanna to continue to feel that way, smoke more. So chain smoking, whether cigarettes or vapes, is the user very literally trying to retain these elevated sensations and effects. Dr. Huberman goes on to point out another very important factor about addiction and nicotine in particular. The addictive potential of a substance isn't just about the maximum amount of dopamine released, but the speed of its onset within the body. As Dr. Huberman explains, it is... It's how quickly that dopamine increases that's going to determine how reinforcing, how habit-forming, and indeed how addictive a particular substance is. And wouldn't you know it, that dopamine increases pretty quickly with vapes. And in the case of vaping, there's a very very rapid increase in blood concentrations of nicotine, much faster than occur with cigarette smoking. As Professor Huberman goes on to say, this onset is very rapid, very dramatic, and that simply cannot be recreated by any other substance. Hmm. Sounds pretty intense. I wonder what might happen if a constant nicotine user were to suddenly find themselves without nicotine access. Probably pretty difficult to feel content without it. And now with a deeper understanding of the underlying science, you can understand why. Join me next week as we continue our quest to understand the vaping epidemic. We'll begin right where we left off with withdrawal. But before you go, there's one more thing I want you to consider about nicotine. It's somewhat ideal for cognitive work. If you're gonna sit down and work on a book, or you're gonna sit down and try and figure out a hard math problem. Modern society, generally speaking, is less physically active than we used to have to be because of our technological conveniences. Leaving many of us with a lot of time to think, but not necessarily clearly. Worrying, predicting, catastrophizing, ruminating, and fretting our way into progressively darker mental space. Can you think of a drug that may help with that? Maybe something that induces the almost, if not the optimal state for getting mental work done. Just some food for thought. And look, as I mentioned earlier, nicotine is a natural compound and our bodies and brains suggest the ability to naturally interact with it. What if the harm doesn't come from the substance, but why and how we choose to use it? It's relaxing, it's healthy, it's loving, but store-bought tobacco is definitely poisonous. And so when you smoke it, it just makes you sick. Nicotine is becoming something that we're abusing to the point of causing harm. A word that we'll sink our teeth into next week. And to me, this indicates just how severely our society feels a sense of lack, of wanting. Quantified very literally by the drive to get more dopamine. Vaping, smoking, or any form of nicotine use are just one avenue to achieve this. Though there are many others I'm sure you can imagine. The irony is, I'm sure that any quick fix mechanism, no matter how powerful, has the capacity to lead to lasting happiness. And isn't that what we're all after? <sighs> that was deep. <sighs> Now, I'll expect each of you to write a 300 to 500 word essay about why we use the word fix to describe drug use. I mean, what are we fixing? The essay part was a joke though. Unless you're gonna do it. But think about it. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up to feed the algorithm, bro. And if you didn't, be sure to let me know why in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to join me for free at my gym, Hume 2.0 Fitness, right here on YouTube, where we help you prevent injury and move better. 
And if you're looking for long form discussions with many interesting athletes, movers, physicians, and fitness professionals, then check out my podcast, Dr. Chris Podcast, also here on YouTube. Otherwise, as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho, where we see one, do one, teach one. Shh. <sighs>